Reds, purples and blues swept across the evening sky and descended into the horizon where the dark haze of dusk blotted out the sun. The grandfather clock in the hall chimed five as the flames danced in the frosted glass sconces of the parlour's gas lamps. Miss Rebecca Trent stood to turn the knobs and further dispel the gloom. Poking the glowing coals within the hearth, she sat in the armchair to its right and settled her gaze upon her guest's back. At six feet three inches, he reminded her of Inspector Caleb Wolfe from the Bow Street Police Station. That was where the similarity ended. Unlike Wolfe, her guest's build was slim but athletic. The cut of his black frock coat mirrored his form to perfection, whilst the material of his deep red waistcoat was of a higher quality than the Metropolitan Police Inspector could afford. In his mid-thirties, he had a military air due to his squared shoulders and rigid back. I'm not superstitious. I wish to make that clear, he said as he turned toward the room. Though his English was immaculate, he spoke with a distinct Russian accent. Neat, soft black hair was combed back from his face, whose pallid complexion almost glowed in the firelight. Vivid brown eyes commanded one's attention if his manner did not. Necessity has brought me here. He left the stuffed herring in its glass case and sat upon the sofa opposite the fireplace. His posture remained faultless, even as he turned his head to regard the clerk. Younger than he by a handful of years, her plum-coloured bustle dress was also tailor-made. Lace trimmed the layers of silk upon her skirts, whilst leaves and flowers outlined in silver adorned a panel on the skirt's front. The bodice had a sweetheart neckline and followed the slender contours of a tight lace corset beneath. Chestnut brown ringlets cascaded from her crown to hang loose between her shoulder blades. My name is Alexander Fafolome, and I'm an inspector with the Russian police. You've heard of the disquiet in my country. I followed what's been written in the newspapers. It's not the same as witnessing it first hand. My purpose here is not to discuss politics. He stood and approached a fireplace to rest his hand upon its mantel shelf. I have a precious stone in my possession, the Minskaya Rosa Ruby. It was smuggled from St. Petersburg across the continent and then brought to London. The survival of one of Russia's oldest aristocratic families is dependent upon this stone. With all due respect, Inspector, the matter seems to be in the interest of private individuals rather than that of your nation. Why then have the police become involved? The family are dear friends of the Tsar. Their welfare is of great interest and concern to him. He faced her, thereby casting half his face in shadow. They and their story aren't your concern. The stones should be the Boshi Society's focus. That is a matter of opinion. Indeed it is. Inspector Barthelemy withdrew from the fireplace and resumed his examination of the encased herring. But the opinion can't be formed until all the facts are heard. He turned toward her. Legend says the stone is cursed, that death and misfortune plague any who possess it. I give these stories no weight of truth. The insatiable desire to own a stone worth a king's ransom ten times over is enough to drive many to desperate and often dangerous measures. He clasped his hands behind his back and continued to speak while he strolled back to the sofa and sat. A dear friend of mine, Miss Isadora Courtenay, has been my host in London. Yet, mere days after my arrival, she was struck down by a violent sickness that almost ended her days. I must know if her sickness was an act of God, or a sign my enemies have discovered my presence. Miss Trent set her notebook aside and stood. What you ask of us is dangerous, Inspector Varfolome. Have you consulted the British police, Scotland Yard? No. He leapt to his feet and glared at her. My presence in London isn't widely known by anyone. He clasped his hands behind his back as he drew in a deep breath. To expose myself to the British police would make an already delicate situation more precarious. All I ask is for the society's assistance in this matter and then I shall be gone. Will you grant it? Miss Trent placed her hand upon her hip. Politics, subterfuge and conspiracy. They're all components for disaster. You wish me to send our members to you like metaphoric lambs to the slaughter. They will be well protected. You have my word. The word of a stranger is the same as no word at all. 
Miss Trent folded her arms across her chest. I will approach the members who I believe would be most suitable for this investigation. I shan't coerce them into endangering their lives if they are reluctant to do so, however. As a police officer, I'm sure you understand my concern. It's not the answer I'd hoped for, but yes, I understand. He retrieved his top hat from the coffee table and held it beneath his arm with his right hand whilst he offered his left. Time is of the essence. I'll hear of their decision by noon tomorrow. Miss Trent gave the hand a brief but firm squeeze. Yes, I'll telephone you. Fine dining at the Savoy Hotel, a purpose-built home with over a hundred rooms on a sprawling country estate, and a legion of servants were some of the fantasies forming in Mr Lorne Cheshire's mind as he gazed upon the ruby through a loop lens. Gripped between his trembling thumb and forefinger, its small size was deceptive when one considered its almost immeasurable value. He licked his dry lips, glanced upward, wiped the sweat from his brow with the handkerchief held in his other hand, and glanced upward again. If you are satisfied, please return it, Inspector Varfolome stated and held out his open palm. A loaded revolver was in his other held at close range and aimed at Mr Cheshire's heart. Mr Cheshire stared at the ruby through the loop lens for a long moment. Visions of candlelit suppers, rose gardens and handsome chambermaids dissolved into a cold winter's morning and his beloved sister stood by his open grave. A chill ran through his core and he shivered. Yes, I'm satisfied, he mumbled and placed the ruby in the Russian's palm. Mr Lorne Reuben Cheshire was a fair-skinned, clean-shaven gentleman in his late thirties. His wavy, chestnut-brown hair, streaked with blonde, was parted down the centre. The point of his chin was mimicked by the point of his nose. A large dimple sat in his chin centre, whilst his cheekbones were almost indistinguishable. Thick, bushy eyebrows crowned his large, deep-set brown eyes. He had introduced himself to the inspector as a jeweller, in addition to being a Bow Street Society member, though he had neglected to recount the circumstances which had led to his membership. What do you think? A second gentleman inquired in a thick, Tyneside accent to the right of Mr Cheshire. A wholesome, off-white beard, moustache, forehead of thick silver hair and wrinkle riddled grey complexion denoted Mr Virgil Verity's sixty years. Yet, despite his advanced age, he was sharp-eyed, well-built, and well groomed. His skeletal like hands gripped the silver skull handle of an ebony walking cane held between his knees. Having arrived in Mr Cheshire and one other, Mr Verity had also introduced himself as a Bow Street Society member. A retired schoolmaster and spiritualist had been the additional roles he had given. There can be no doubt about its authenticity as a ruby, Mr Cheshire replied. Please elaborate. Inspector Varfolome interjected in a dry tone as he slipped the revolver into his frock coat pocket. The name ruby derives from the Latin word ruba to mean red. I'd say your ruby originates from Thailand and is rare for many reasons, Mr Cheshire replied and settled into the high back chair. The three gentlemen were gathered round one end of a long wooden table in the dining room of a well-furnished affluent home. Firstly, it has been custom cut rather than native cut. Secondly, its high-grade colour and clarity are unlike anything I've encountered either here in London or in the sales catalogues of the Parisian and American jewellers. Mr Cheshire looked the inspector square in the eyes as he added, I would stake my professional reputation on this being the most valuable ruby in the world. More valuable than diamonds? Mr Verity inquired. Than diamonds of a comparable size, yes, Mr Cheshire replied which is why you and your boast society would have been as cautious as I, Inspector Varfolome said. But I must ask you to forgive the revolver all the same, gentlemen. The ruby's true significance goes far beyond its monetary worth. I know, Mr Cheshire replied. Inspector Varfolome's eyes narrowed. How so? I may have never laid eyes upon it before this afternoon, Inspector, but the Minskaya Rosa is legendary amongst jewellers, Mr Cheshire replied. Its existence has been questioned by many, including me, due to the preposterous claim it had near perfect colour and clarity. A claim proven true by your own admission, 
Inspector Ruffalo Major retorted as he placed the ruby into a palm-sized red velvet box that he then closed and locked with a small gold key. The key was attached to a chain hung around his neck. Once the box was secured, he slipped the key beneath the folds of his cravat and shirt. Yes, but I wouldn't wish to possess it, Mr Cheshire replied. Legend has it that sickness, destitution and tragedy have befallen all who've owned it. Even the once proud Minsk family of St. Petersburg has become destitute and nearly extinct since they purchased the Rosa in a Paris auction last year. There is much disquiet in my country, Inspector Vafola may replied, and many have died in their pursuit of the ruby, both prior to the Minsk family's ownership and since. You would be wise to ensure you don't join them, Mr. Cheshire. You wanted to examine the ruby to satisfy yourself it was as I purported. You are now satisfied, and under obligation to see to it, I am given the same. Mr Verity, you claim to be knowledgeable about the world of spirits. Are you also knowledgeable about curses and hexes? I, Mr Verity, shifted his weight within the chair as he adjusted his grip upon his cane. And there are many cursed gemstones. The Hope Diamond is a good example. Owned by the Hope family at the moment, which is where the stone gets its name, it was called the French Blue and part of the French Crown Jewels when King Louis the Sixteenth and Marie Antoinette tried to escape France in 1791. The revolution sealed their fates, but those of the diamond's owners since then haven't been much better. Even His Royal Highness King George the Sixth of this noble island had lots of de- debt when he died back in 1830. I've never read or been told about your ruby and its reputation, though. He glanced around the room. Have you heard knocking or unknown voices since it was given to you? Inspector Varfolomay smirked. No. Have you had any personal misfortune, accidents, sudden bad luck at the gambling tables or loss of reputation? Mr Verity inquired. I don't gamble, Inspector Varfolomay replied. But no, I've experienced none of those things. But then you don't own the ruby, do you? Mr Verity smiled. You merely as temporary guardian. Some would argue possession is possession in the eyes of a curse, whether it is physically, financially or legally, Inspector Vaffolome pointed out. Mr Verity lifted a hand from his cane. Perhaps, perhaps not. It would depend on who cursed it and how, but we know nothing of that. Also, if you want the Bosch Society to prove the ruby is cursed, you'll be disappointed. I have not found any test yet that can do such a thing. If Isadora's sickness was caused by my enemies, the curse, real or not, will not matter to me. Inspector Varfolome replied as he lit a small, brown, hand-rolled cigarette. Dr Lynette Locke is highly trained, Mr Verity said. She'll be able to shed some light on the mystery, I'm sure. And if your enemies were behind Miss Courtenay's sickness? Mr Chester inquired. Inspector Varfolome exhaled the smoke from his lungs. That is none of your concern. Mr Cheshire swallowed hard as he and Mr Verity exchanged apprehensive glances. And you're a member of the Bowes Society, Miss Isadora Courtenay inquired. In her late twenties, she had plaited blonde hair and vivid blue eyes. She sat in a winged-back, dark green armchair with a thick woolen blanket draped over her knees despite being adjacent to the hearth that had an immense fire within it. Her lithe form was swallowed by a loose-fitted, high-necked blouse with leg of mutton sleeves, whilst her pallid complexion seemed bone-like in the firelight. Yes, there are several members who are women, including our clerk Miss Becca Trent, Dr Lynette Locke replied. Older than Miss Courtenay by a small margin, Her height was markedly greater at six feet. Her dark blonde hair was pinned into an elaborate ancient Greece-inspired hairstyle that began at the nape of her neck and ended in a sculptured mass of curls upon her crown. Dark blue-green eyes were bordered by soft cheekbones, which accentuated the smooth contours of her face and intensified her handsomeness. Her attire consisted of a duck egg blue loose-fitted blouse, high-waist midnight blue straight-line skirt, and a black leather belt with a silver buckle. She sat in the twin of Miss Courtenay's chair on the half's opposite side. A young woman entered the parlour and placed a tray of tea things upon a low oak table between the armchairs. 
wearing the long sleeve black dress, full bodied white apron, and mop cap of a maid. She appeared to be in her late teens. An unkempt dark brown bun sat at the base of her skull, whilst her slender hands were covered by dry, cracked skin. Thank you, Anna. Miss Portelay addressed the maid and watched as she served the tea. Once she was served, she continued, This is Dr Lynette Locke of the Bose Society. Anna dipped her form in a brief curtsy. It's an honour, ma'am. There's no need to be so formal with me, Dr Locke replied with a smile. Oh, apologies, ma'am, Anna replied with a glance at her mistress. Please sit with us. Miss Courtenay invited as she indicated a high-backed wooden chair in the corner. Whilst Anna retrieved it and set it down by the low table facing the fireplace, Miss Courtenay explained, Dr Locke is here to discover the cause of my sudden sickness. Anna clasped her hands and resting them upon their side in her lap, rubbed her thumbs together. I'm not sure how I can help with that, ma'am. She glanced at Dr Locke. I'm not a girl who knows much. Often we know something without being aware we know it, Dr Locke reassured. From Miss Courtenay, she inquired, For how long has Inspector Varfolome been your guest? A few days, a week perhaps, Miss Courtenay replied. And he has been a friend of yours for how long? Dr Locke inquired. Three years, Miss Courtenay replied. We met at Lord Sinclair's winter ball during Alexander's first visit to London. She sipped her tea, winced, and allowed Anna to take it from her and return it to the tray. My stomach has tolerated little since my sickness. Could you describe your sickness? Dr Locke inquired as she opened her notebook. And tell me when it first took hold. Miss Courtenay held her stomach and took several quick breaths. Her complexion had also paled further. Excuse me a moment, she muttered, and fell silent whilst Anna prepared a cup of warm water for her mistress and pressed it into her hand. Could you fetch some ginger if you have it, please? Dr Locke requested. It helps ease nausea. Anna nodded and hurried from the room. Take your time, Dr Locke said to Miss Courtenay, who continued to have the look of someone about to vomit. All she could manage was a curt nod and a deep, shuddering breath by way of response. Both women were therefore relieved when Anna returned a few moments later and Dr Locke was able to administer the ginger to her patient. Thank you. Miss Courtenay said once the spice had taken effect. I feel a little better. She forced a smile. You wanted to know about my sickness, but I hadn't intended to give you a demonstration. It's clear you still suffer its effects, Dr Locke replied. Miss Courtenay hummed. I am feeble in body, to be certain. She gave a stronger smile, but it began on the third evening following Inspector Varfolome's arrival. We were having dinner and reminiscing about Lord Sinclair's ball. Mere moments into our meal, though, I felt an intense warmth descend upon me. I thought it was the heat from the fire, as it was a cold night, but then I had this terrible pain in my stomach. As wretched as it sounds, it felt like someone had driven a red-hot knife into me. I wrapped my arm around me and lurched forward. Inspector Varfolome was asking if I was well, but the pain was so great it had stolen my voice. Did you empty your stomach at all? Dr Locke inquired as she wrote her notes. Yes. If my body had permitted it, I would have done so in more private quarters, but as it transpires, I couldn't move from my seat. I therefore emptied my stomach at great speed upon the, she grimaced, dining room table. She half covered her face with her hand. I was so humiliated. One cannot always control one's bodily functions, I'm afraid. Dr Locke said. Anna, did you prepare the meal for your mistress and inspector? Yes, ma'am. I prepare all of the mistress's meals. What did you prepare when the night she became unwell? Chicken and wild garlic soup to my mum's own recipe. Did Inspector Varfolome also have the soup? Dr Locke inquired. Yes, ma'am, Anna replied. But he had little chance to taste it before my sickness took hold, Miss Courtenay interjected. So engrossed was he in recounting his memories of the ball. Dr Locke's brow lofted. I see. She made a note. Do you still have the wild garlic you used for the soup, Anna? Yes, ma'am. May I see it, please? Anna looked at her mistress, who gave a subtle nod. The young maid therefore stood and, leaving the room for a few minutes, 
returned with a bunch of green leaf stems with white bell-like flowers. She gave them to Dr. Locke, who retrieved a magnifying glass from her gladstone bag on the floor. Peering at the flowers, then the leaves, and back at the flowers through it, she said, It's miraculously good fortune you didn't consume more of the soup than you did. Why, what's wrong with it? Anna inquired as she looked between Dr. Locke and the plant. Did you pick this yourself? Dr. Locke inquired. Yes, but I did everything my mum told me to do, Anna replied. You had never picked it alone before then? Dr. Locke inquired. No, Anna replied and her face turned white. It is wild garlic, isn't it? No. Dr. Locke plucked a stem from the bunch and held it up for Miss Courtenay to see. And if you hadn't been so engaged in conversation with respect to Bartholomew, she met her client's anxious gaze with a grave one. You would be dead. None of what you said makes sense, Inspector Varfolome stated. Standing before the parlour's fireplace, he looked between Dr Locke, Mr Cheshire and Mr Verity, who stood shoulder to shoulder opposite. Miss Courtenay remained in her armchair whilst Anna had taken this twin. Inspector Varfolome lifted his hand toward Mr Cheshire. You concede the ruby is as valuable as I said. He moved his hand to indicate Mr Verity. You can't prove the ruby's cursed and finally indicate Dr Locke, and you claim Miss Courtenay was poisoned by the soup she ate. He dropped his hand to his side. Yet, together, you want me to believe my enemies don't know I'm in London because there was never an attempt to murder Miss Courtenay. Miss Courtenay's sickness was caused by the soup she ate during dinner, but Anna thought she had used wild garlic, Dr Locke explained, instead of what she actually served, chicken and convalia majalis soup. Convalaria Maljalis is known as Lily of the Valley to most people. She held up a green stem. Wild garlic tends to have star-like flowers. These are more akin to bells. She placed the stem onto the inspector's open palm once he'd held out his hand for a second time. See? Yes, I see, he muttered as he turned the stem over. It's a mistake commonly made by inexperienced foragers. Dr Locke looked down at the nervous-looking maid like Anna. She says she didn't know it was poison, but you cannot know that for certain, Inspector Varfolome replied as he turned hard eyes to the young maid, unless she is interrogated to the fullest degree. Dr Locke placed a hand upon her hip and moved between the policeman and Anna. We can know by looking in her eyes and seeing how she trembles with fear. This girl is innocent, Inspector. The demands of our agreement have been met by both sides and now, Doctor, Inspector Varfolome looked past us, Mr Cheshire and Mr Verity. Gentlemen, our business together must come to an end. Your Miss Trent will have your fee in full come the morning. Dr Locke narrowed her eyes as Mr Verity used his cane to approach her from behind. Mr Cheshire, meanwhile, back toward the door. If you think we're going to leave this poor child to your mercy, Inspector, then you clearly misunderstood the reasons for the Bosch Society's existence, Dr Locke warned. Come on, lass, Mr Verity encouraged as he held out his withered hand to Anna. She isn't going anywhere, Inspector Varfolome retorted as he slipped his hand into his frock coat and pulled out the loaded revolver. Now wait a minute, Mr Cheshire said with his hands held aloft. We don't want any trouble. Leave Anna here and take your lives with you, Inspector Varfolome said, a cold glare aimed at Dr Locke. Alexander, no, Miss Courtenay pleaded. You're on British soil now, sir, Mr Verity pointed out. Shoot us and you'll swing for it. If your enemies don't find you first, Dr Locke added. Inspector Varfolome adjusted his grip on the revolver. Come on, lass, Mr Verity encouraged again and Anna stood. Stay where you are, Inspector Varfolome ordered, his gaze still fixed upon Dr Locke. Stop this at once, Miss Courtenay cried. The moment Inspector Varfolome lowered the revolver to look down at his friend, though, Dr Locke grasped Anna's hand and held Mr Verity's arm and pulled both to the door Mr Cheshire had opened for them. Yet, as they hurried from the house and clambered into a waiting hansom cab, Mr Cheshire looked back at the parlour window. Seeing the pale face of Inspector Varfolome staring back at him, 
His blood then ran cold when he saw the look in the Russian policeman's eyes. It was one Mr Cheshire would have terrifying visions about for many, many nights to come.